good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining the Office of Court Administration. My name is Michael Smith. I'm standing in for Nitu Gill today, and I'm going to be today's moderator. Uh, I'm the management analyst with the uh, Research and Court Services Division at the Office of Court Administration. And today's uh, the Research and Court Services Division moderates a webinar each month, and today's topic is court security with Hector Gomez. Um, prior to the presentation, I just want to cover a couple of house housekeeping details. Please make sure all of your microphones are on mute. Uh, if you have any questions, utilize the question box. I'm going to be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation. If it's a technical question, we'll try and address it immediately. If it's a question pertaining to the topic on the presentation, we're going to address it in a Q&A session at the end of the unit, uh, end of the webinar. Without any further ado, um, I'm introducing to you again Hector Gomez, um, our Court Security Director here at the Office of Court Administration. Welcome, Hector. Thank you, Mike. Uh, welcome, audience out there. Well, we've had a couple of weeks, a couple of Thursdays, discussing court security, Judge Kashurik on the beginning end and uh, Judge Crump last week. And I'm going to address to you, with you, uh, some of the uh, things in court security that I've seen since I've uh, come on board and uh, visited vast parts of Texas, visiting courthouses and discussing with a lot of the funding authorities, judges, sheriffs, constables, and bailiffs out there, uh, their concerns. So without uh, any further uh, discussion, if you have any questions, hold them to the end. We'd be more than happy to address any of your concerns. I won't uh, harp too much on on uh, what happened to Judge Koshirk. I think we all know, and of course, by her presentation a couple of weeks ago. Um, but there it is, just a brief summary of what happened. She was uh, coming home one night, and there was a lawn leaf bag in front of her security gate and of course Chimney O'Neary who had conspired with others to assassinate her attempted to uh, take her life that Friday night in 2015 and uh, in the process she was uh, severely injured uh, recovered recovering and is back on the bench here in Travis County uh, the subject that was arrested Chimney O'Neary was charged convicted in the United States District Court here in Austin con and convicted and received a life term without the possibility of parole. The uh, Texas Judicial Council called immediately for uh, a, a bill that was subsequently passed by the, le the 85th legislature sponsored by Senator uh, Judith Zaffarini and Jim Smythe, referred to as uh, Senate Bill 42, the Judge Judy Kasher Judicial and Courthouse Security Act. And uh, a lot of the elements in the bill that I'm in charge of, of overseeing is obviously the establishment of court security committees throughout Texas at the county and municipal level, training of our officers that are responsible for court security matters, uh, that they are undertaking the required uh, T-Cold 10999 court security course. And of course, what is very important is the mandatory reporting of court incidents to OCA within three days of the event. In addition, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with SB 42, but as, as you can see, the immediate challenge is that we have approximately 4,000 judges across the state. And then if you start uh, trying to add the factor of judges who have retired, uh, resigned, uh, that weren't reelected, that are also entitled to the protections, you can see that that number exponentially increases. And then you double that number if you uh, include the spouses. So, of course, we have a, a great grand responsibility to make sure that the judges are aware uh, of this privacy protection that's afforded to them and that they take advantage of that protection. We'll go into more detail with that. Um, as you can see, what's quite obvious is just the that threats across the state of Texas against judges are increasing. And this is evident uh, not only by uh, threats that one can make via social media, fax, letter, telephonic, but you're actually, as we just had recently here Monday in, in Dallas at the U.S. District Court in, in Dallas, um, you know, one attempt to uh, shoot out the front doors of the, uh, the federal building there in Dallas. So the discussion is continuing. I mean, it seems like it, we, we don't go a week without some, some event that affects uh, security will be at schools, churches, uh, corporate offices, and, and courthouses and court facilities. And also want to make sure that court support staff, judges, you know, that we're not always looking at the loudmouth person that's making the threats. It'll always be, you know, or at least we should be concerned 
of, of the calmest person in the room or in that orbit. Um, because again, we don't want to focus. You want to have overall operational security of your of your building, your courthouse, and of course of your person. So again, be be aware of that. Um, what's very important as far as SB 42 that I see among many other things is that we need to do a better job in reporting court security incidents across Texas. Uh, there is a requirement again that the law enforcement entity that is in charge of security in your courthouse or court facility is required to report an incident. And that incident is a subjective matter. That is something that the law enforcement agencies uh, can determine themselves what is an incident. And I'm going to give you some examples throughout this presentation of what could be construed as being an incident and should be reported to uh, OCA. As you can see by this chart, um, 2018, the end of the end of FY 2018, we've, we've had a marketable increase of incident reporting as compared to uh, obviously FY 17 and prior years. I can tell you right now in our current FY 19, we expect to surpass FY8, FY 2018 incident reporting. So as you can see, uh, the messages getting out in terms of the entities that are responsible for reporting incidents, we're doing a better job, I hope, of making sure you're aware of that, that mandate, but also uh, that law enforcement is uh, better aware of what their now new role in reporting these incidents to OCA are. Again, as I said, an incident is very subjective. You make that determination, but these are a couple of hints, you know, does it, that, that you should use. One, obviously, is does it cause your security posture to elevate? Um, more observant. Do you happen to add more manpower in patrols? Do you, is, it, is the event or incident, potential incident, disrupting or altering the court schedule? contraband, medical episodes, threats, things of that nature. And it, these incidents may not even occur in the courthouse or the, or excuse me, in the chambers or the office of the clerk. It can happen in another department within, within the courthouse, but that draws a law enforcement response to take care of that event. That needs to be reported as an incident. Again, these are things that affect the posture of that law enforcement entity that's responsible for taking care of the uh, incidents in the courthouse. Look at the examples of the behaviors and activities to report. I'll give you a second just to kind of look at those. These are, these are all instances and events that can happen in your courthouse or your court facility. So these would be considered reportable incidents to OCA. Now going back to SB 42, the, the bill specifically mandates that OCA have processes in place with the Texas Ethics Commission, the appraisal district, and your county registrar uh, to have your personal and residential information redacted, scrubbed from the public available, publicly available websites. Now, the DPS part is, is that DPS places your information into the alternative address program. And that alternative address program is in place so that if, as an option, you and your spouse desire to proceed to DPS to acquire a driver's license with the courthouse address, if you take your oath with you, they will compare you, can confirm you are in fact a judge with your oath and that you are in fact in that alternative address program and you will be uh, issued a driver's license with the courthouse address. Now, let me get into a little bit more detail with that. This is a one-time event where you actually have to present yourself to DPS. They want to lay eyes on you the first time. Going forward after that, you can renew online as you normally would. Now, when you uh, undertake this, this option of having your courthouse address replaced, you will incur the standard state $11 change of address fee. So keep that in mind. And at the same time, you're at DPS uh, changing your driver's license, you may also option to uh, have your license to carry for those that have a license to carry to also have your courthouse address uh, reflected in your license to carry. Now, when I refer to filling out that privacy questionnaire, these are examples where we have uh, traveled to uh, training conferences throughout the state and we've brought 
the laptops with the, uh, the the actual program for the judges to actually sit down and fill out this uh, five to ten minute privacy security questionnaire, where we will process those uh, that questionnaire again with those entities that I just previously mentioned. So the response is getting is getting better as time goes on. We've had a significant number of judges uh, take advantage of this protection. It is a lifetime protection. There is um, nothing you need to do further. Again, they apply for you and your spouse's life. Uh, whether you retire, you're not elected, or you decide to, uh, to resign from office, the protections will still remain and apply. Now, I've always asked uh, or suggested, recommended, that judges allow about 30 days after they've submitted their security questionnaire to OCA to proceed at their option to DPS to obtain their uh, driver's license change of address. Uh, we are still dealing with the human element in the end, so there could be some breakdown or there could be some possibilities of uh, someone just not getting the word or not being aware of the SB42 requirements. So be patient. If you have any problems with that, please give me a call here at OCA and we will be more than happy to intervene and escalate if we need. Uh, also, again, take a copy of your oath. Uh, we process the information provided by the judges. Uh, we provide to those three entities mentioned, and we only provide that information which is needed for those entities to have your information redacted. So again, all those entities do not get all your information. They just get what they minimally need to, again, scrub you from that, uh, publicly, uh, that public website. And as I mentioned, DPS will confirm you are in the alternative address program, and it would help if you would bring your oath. Other than that, uh, you will not receive any correspondence from DPS at your courthouse. That is a masking effort in case you lose or have your driver's license stolen. It will come back to a courthouse address and not your home. So again, you will not receive any correspondence. Do not change your voting location. That will remain the same as it always has been. And uh, again, going forward, you can renew online as you normally would. Now, this is very important because I've had this asked, and I did inquire with the uh, local Austin area ATF office. If you have taken advantage of the privacy protections and you hold a driver's license with your courthouse address, and you intend, intend to purchase a firearm, you need to take with you documentary proof of your name and your home address, such as a cable bill, cell bill, utility bill, et cetera, in addition to your driver's license. That information will support uh, the requirements of the ATF Form 4473. So again, since your driver's license will not have your home address, you need to take supplemental verification of where you live by taking, again, one some of those examples of, uh, of the bills that I mentioned. SB 510 was also passed by the previous legislative session, and it expanded the list of those uh, who would be able to take advantage of privacy protections pertaining to their personal and residential information. And that list expanded to the employees of federal and state judges. And of course, the, the justification was that employees of judges tend to uh, interact frequently, if not daily, with litigants that may have, again, criminal histories, mental instability as examples. So it's, it's an effort for your employees, judges' employees, to protect themselves and at least at a minimum get their personal and residential information scrubbed from their local appraisal district. And that will require executing the Texas Comptroller Form 50-284. And uh, they just need to present that to their local appraisal district and that should uh, take care of uh, that, that element of the bill. This was also passed, as I said, the same time that SB 42 was passed, but didn't get a lot of airplay. So again, I would encourage you to uh, remind your employees, those of judges, to uh, have them take advantage of this, uh, this, this privacy protection. Ah, let's look at contemporary judicial threats. 
simply in in our modern time we're we're starting to see a lot of this uh, this come up and surface and of course g courthouses are are convenient venues for uh, people to exercise uh, their right to protest, petition, or, or again, just message what they want. And these are some of the examples of some of these groups. These are just a few of the groups that uh, you are likely to encounter in or around your courthouse. So again, they're not unique to any particular courthouse. These are just a few examples of what you may see out there. Some of you may have a lot of involvement with the sovereign citizen movement. And of course, as you know, they are driven by a belief system that subscribes the individual into that movement. So I know, and I've, I've heard through a lot of experiences, uh, my, own, my, uh, my own personal experiences, as well as uh, discussing with some of the judges out there in, in Texas, that this is something that is not going away anytime soon. We just gotta know how to be able to deal with them and know exactly um, you know, what motivates them and how you are going to, because a lot of times they're just goading you into, into a confrontation. So be aware of that. Santa Muerte has uh, been around here in the United States since about 2005. It's a, uh, it's a again, it's a, uh, for lack of a better word, it's, 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 a, it's a folk saint or a deity that's generally subscribed to by uh, prison gangs, drug trade cartels, or those that are just involved in criminal behavior. Um, it's associated with protection. They revere the saint. And you'll see this in the form of a the tattoo of the Grim Reaper or the actual saint on, on, on the back, the front, arms, legs of, of, uh, of individuals you may encounter. Again, this is not the basis of probable cause to secure a warrant for, for, for drugs, for example. This is just for operational awareness. If you see this, you're aware of what it stands for and it may, you know, especially law enforcement, it may pique your curiosity to maybe look somewhere that you may be able to find that that probable cause, acquire that probable cause to dig deeper. So again, this is just awareness. You're going to see this. It's increasing uh, typically in the Hispanic community, and you'll see this along the southwest border quite a bit, extensively. Relative to courthouse security, I'm going to go over just briefly, just so that you have an, uh, an understanding or awareness of what a, a typical courthouse, if we had, you know, again, the resources to, to have all the equipment, technology, human resources possible to properly staff a uh, courthouse, uh, you would see. And of course, the first thing that comes to mind, the first thing that I look for when I conduct assessments of courthouse throughout Texas is, is camera, camera coverage, because you we ideally want to blend of human resources, of law enforcement, and technology to kind of blend in and complement each other when it comes to courthouse security. So effective exterior security obviously starts with cameras, exterior cameras. Having a 360 degree approach around the courthouse of what's coming, what's going, and what's suspicious. Lighting is very important. You can never have enough lighting. Uh, and that means lighting that extends all the way to the parking area where your employees uh, may park in the evening in the event they have to work late. I'm talking about leaving lights on on a timer, uh, some type of system inside the courthouse. Make it look, uh, make it serve as a deterrent to criminal behavior would be, uh, you know, people that would break into a courthouse for whatever reason they would uh, want to break into a courthouse through the easy spots. They're going to look for dark areas of a, of a courthouse or a court building. So keep that in mind when you're doing your own self-assessment self of your courthouse. And I would encourage uh, bailiffs, deputy sheriffs, those that are charged with security of a courthouse to give your courthouse or your court facility a look inside and out. Again, when you look at your courthouse, look for those vulnerabilities. Be intent on looking for those vulnerabilities. And those are the items you want to look at and, br and bring to the attention of your local court security committee. New construction of courthouses, we're seeing a lot of this, what, what I call knee walls. Knee walls obviously are a uh, post 
Oklahoma City, although I've seen them in his, some historic courthouses, but this is merely to prevent a vehicle from penetrating the front doors of a courthouse. Again, a, it's a relatively inexpensive effort to try to, again, minimize, if not eliminate, the potential from a vehicle from uh, driving up to the front doors of a courthouse. Landscape and bollards, landscape and boulders are very easy. You can place them kind of all over around a courthouse or a court facility, and it will, again, eliminate the possibility of vehicles from driving up into the front doors of a courthouse. Interior security, obviously best practices currently is to minimize the entry to one focal entry point. And if you can, in historic courthouses, for example, shut your remaining doors down, allow them to be an egress door in case of emergency. Have your employees ideally come in through a dedicated door system with a key card. But the focus is, is to try to minimize, again, try to minimize your, these multiple door systems that we have in some of these courthouses from uh, again being just overtaxed by having members of the public coming in unscreened and then we don't know what we have in a courthouse in case we have a crisis um, and of course an entry control system that's important you want uh, ideally you want a key card system is preferred because again hard keys are just hard to manage we don't know a lot of times where key keys hard keys are located as a result of retirements, resignations, terminations, and things of that nature, keys tend to get lost and unaccounted. So the next best way to control entry is to have a key or a swipe card because those instruments can be programmed accordingly. And challenges that I see with, with historical courthouses is the internal circulation where we generally have the judge uh, compromised as he or she is walking through a, a uh, courthouse. They, they tend to have interaction with the public in an elevator or the defendant. Um, they're not kept in a sterile environment. And again, I know those are challenges that are unique to uh, historical courthouses, but again, it's gonna, it should be incumbent upon the local uh, law enforcement entity of that courthouse to see what they can do. because. Uh, to be quite honest, sometimes you just can't do much with what you have, but at least you can make some subtle changes, again, um, to try to keep the judges as safe as you can and keep them separate uh, to the extent you can from uh, the defendants in the case uh, or the public. And of course, courthouses still have to be subjected to the services of FedEx, UPS, deliveries, trash cans, uh, trash workers, and things of that nature. If you have suspicious uh, articles, uh, if you have boxes, questionable boxes, I mean, you need to have, you should ideally uh, have this stuff, this material scanned, boxes scanned, packages scanned, uh, look at them, give it a good look. Does it look right? Does it feel right? Does it smell funny? I mean, these are things that, you know, if you have a, a very good program in place at your local courthouse, this is something you certainly want to uh, put in practice. You know, do we have a plan in place to deal with, uh, again, packages and deliveries? Interior cameras. Uh, they're, they're challenging in historical courthouses, I can tell you, because uh, the Historical Commission tends to um, uh, not want holes or any type of um, attached equipment in some of these historical buildings. Um, nevertheless, cameras serve an important purpose. They allow you to see where you can't see. And there are places that in the courthouse, if you have blind spots, that your, your law enforcement agencies that are responsible for security need to see. As I said before, a complement of law enforcement and technology will provide you just about the best form of security that you possibly can have. And being able to look at and address your blind spots and your hallways and stairwells is a good step. And I can tell you right now, uh, cameras are cheaper than they were 10 years ago. 
so if you are in a in a in a fiscal posture to to get your cameras, I would encourage you to take advantage of these cameras, install them, make sure that your software updates are uh, also considered because you're going to have to go through that frequently. Uh, and again, it, court, it, in in courtroom specific. I would recommend that if you're going to entertain the thought of having cameras in your courtroom, that they would be for observation only, not for recording or audio. In case there's a crisis or the panic or duress button is activated, your local dispatch certainly wants to be able to see inside the courtroom as they are dispatching officers to respond. So again, I would emphasize just to observe only, not to record. Another thing I see uh, quite frequently out in the field is a lot of court benches, a lot of benches and uh, court clerk public exchange windows that are lacking in Kevlar or some type of layered sheet steel, and of course, or even in some instances, uh, uh, ballistic glass. Uh, consider these efforts. I think that at a minimum, all court benches should have some form of Kevlar protection behind the bench in the event of an active shooter. At least the judge has the ability to get behind that bench and, and hide for the duration till uh, law enforcement responds. Also, I see in, <clears throat> in my travels that a lot of lighting systems are in the public area, and uh, it doesn't take someone with nefarious intentions to hit a bank of lights, make your room dark, and then proceed with whatever their intentions are. So security lights, such as this uh, example right here, is something that law enforcement or a court staff would have control over the lights as well as the uh, HVAC systems. This is an example of a uh, judicial bench that does not have Kevlar or any type of protection. Now, that not only is, is that uh, a concern, but you can see that there's um, a lack of distance between the defendant and the judge. Now, I'm, I'm making an assumption that the defendant is, is uh, facing the judge close up and, and, and relatively close. So by comparison, I want you to look just at it. You can take that table to the right as you see it, and you can move that to the front of that bench just to create distance. That's all you want to do is just create that distance in case the defendant um, decides to grab something, a staple, a local stapler that's sitting there, uh, some type of something that he can uh, render as a weapon, and at least it creates that distance. Here's an example of a bench that, uh, again, by just simply moving a table in front, it creates that distance. That's what we want to see ideally. Public exchange windows with bullet resistant glass. Down on the bottom, uh, you have cinder block and um, sandbags that are able to withstand uh, any type of bullets coming that direction. And also, there's a camera on top looking, observing what's coming towards that, uh, that window. Stanchion ropes, very easy, they're cheap, and all we're really trying to do when it comes to at least the basics in, in court security is we're trying to alter human behavior. And we're just like anyone else, if you give us a path to walk through, we are going to follow it. So if, take advantage of, if again, if you have a traffic flow problem in your courthouse and you need to direct people to go a certain way or restrict them from going a certain way, Stanchion ropes are an easy cure, again, just to alter people's behavior. This is an example of a court facility where everybody comes in on the left picture, on the pictures to the left. Everyone comes in through one building, one side of the building, and leaves through the opposite end. Again, uh, it's very easy to manage the traffic flow. Cameras. Cameras are great as long as they're not hiding behind a thick uh, tree, such as this one right here. And here's a closer picture. Again, that, that just has to do with management. F foliage, managing your foliage, your brush, your shrubs, and your trees around your facility. I mean, you're going to get the most effective use of that camera if that camera can see what uh, it was intended to see. 
duress alarms, panic buttons. They come in all forms, shapes, and sizes. In my travels looking at some courthouses throughout Texas, I see a new version of a, a duress alarm that are loose and in a drawer, and sometimes not even in the same location. So I would encourage the permanent installation of your duress or your panic buttons under the bench or somewhere that in the event of a crisis, you don't have to look for a loose uh, duress button. And at the same time, practice pushing this button, have it checked one, at least monthly just to make sure it's working. Because I'm also, I've also encountered uh, uh, courthouses where uh, there is no active process in place to, again, to test the duress alarms. And, um, and again, that's just something that can be established in a local courthouse policy and procedure a document. Uh, specifically addressing duress alarms. Kevlar behind the bench in this particular uh, courthouse. Judges chambers. I see a mixed bag of an electronic control package and essentially an electronic control package consists of the camera, the monitor, the door strike, um, of course, with an intercom. And this allows uh, the judicial assistant, the court administrator, or the judge themselves to control who comes in their chambers. Um, I've, I've been to way too many courthouses in this past year where I'm just able to walk essentially almost into the uh, into the judge's chambers without being challenged. Um, I think this would, right next to Kevlar behind the bench, would be the next best thing that uh, courthouses start looking at, controlling who goes inside a, a judge's chambers. We need, again, to establish controls. I know it's easy just to let people you know inside your building and your, and your, and your office and your chambers, but if we're going to have you know, a realistic approach towards security, we need to start the practice and, uh, and, and again, can pr and practice uh, this effort daily. Here's an example of a courthouse that what I say would would be in need of a uh, electronic control package because the judge would come right out of his front door right into the uh, courtroom. So there's going to be a lot of public interaction right at that particular juncture. So again, um, look at your facility, see what your needs are, see if you need some of these things here that again, that would, once they're implemented, once they're in practice, you'll find that it's going to be uh, almost routine and you won't bother with it much. Uh, this particular municipal courthouse has a high setback and an elevation. As you can see, this was, in my opinion, this is probably a post-Oklahoma City uh, construction, constructed building. Uh, it has, again, a high elevation to prevent a vehicle from pen penetrating the front doors, and it has a setback where, from within, you can see from a great distance what is coming at you, and, you, and you're in a better position to react. Here's an example of another court courthouse where it's at the ground level. You notice the doors. This is at the ground level. There is no elevation. There is no setback. And there's really nothing to prevent a vehicle from getting up close and personal to those front doors. So again, landscaping boulders, bollards, heavy concrete benches. Again, you can just place them subtly just to minimize a vehicle from getting real close up to that front door. Even small things such as securing your sewer holes can keep anyone with nefarious intentions of crawling into the sewer system to get into a building, again, for whatever their intended purpose is. There's examples of uh, courthouses that I visited, took pictures, and I use these. Uh, to show examples. Now, granted, these are historic courthouses, and, and maybe the requirements were that uh, these doors could not be manipulated. But as you can see, they have exterior pins. And those exterior pins, you may have, are, are, these exterior pins are an example that even if you have the most elaborate security system in your courthouse, when, when I'm talking about glass breakage sensors and motion detectors and things of that nature, a ball pin hammer and a screwdriver is all it's going to take to pop those pins out and get inside that courthouse. So again, 
look at those, tap weld those pins in there or manipulate them and turn them inside out, turn them inside so you can have this kind of look right here where the pins are internal. District judge, parking only. I see that quite a bit in my travels. Uh, something we need, a practice that we need to start changing. Um, it's, it's tough, I understand. We can probably, uh, my recommendation is that you make that law enforcement only with an understanding that you park there. Uh, authorized personnel only. Uh, assign parking by number, but at least at a minimum, get the signage out of there that clearly illustrates and highlights uh, where a judge parks. In this particular historic courthouse, there are two stairwells that go up to the same second floor. Now, my recommendation would be to shut one down and shut one of the, the door, the actual stairways down. And, and the way you can accomplish that, again, is simple. Stanchions at the top, stanchions at the bottom. At least in, in an emergency, you still have the ability to egress from that, uh, that stairwell. But again, this, these are just small, zero cost things you can do within your own courthouse that can affect, uh, again, changing behaviors, what we're trying to do, change the public's behavior. And that's just one small effort to accomplish that. Again, another small cost item is, is securing your deadbolt. So you can place these uh, deadbolt covers over your doors and it prevents anyone from manipulating the uh, deadbolt lock. This particular courthouse decided to shut the whole street down and it creates, as you can see, creates that, that distance, that setback. Um, there's a short little knee wall, as you can see, uh, that, but probably would not prevent a vehicle from jumping that curb and getting up there. Transport vehicles. If you have transport vans, prisoner transport vans in your area, I would not recommend that they park next to a Dixie dumpster, a trash dumpster. You, know, you can secrete items in there. People can be hidden in there uh, if there were an escape attempt. Um, so I think incendiary devices, things of that nature. Now, the picture next to it with the uh, the benches, the steel benches there, that's a public area for smoking. Now, you, you have a confluence of two things. You have the Dixie dumpster, the Dixie dumpster right there on one end, and then you have a pace, a, an area where uh, the public... Uh, convenes to smoke. So again, you're and then you you park your prisoner transport there, and you walk those prisoners right uh, in front of the public there. Again, someone with nefarious intentions. Uh, these are small things you need to you think about when you do this, a self-assessment of your own courthouse. Again, small changes. Old historic courthouses that have a lot of windows. Very simple fixes are uh, shutters or uh, window curtains. Again, what we're trying to do is eliminate someone from the outside from being able to see what's inside and who is inside. Trash receptacles and mailboxes, very common at or near front doors, front entrances of courthouses. Again, very similar with trash dumpsters. They can be used as a means to secrete items, contraband weapons, things of that nature. Uh, get them out of the front doorway. I mean, that's, that's about as plain as I could uh, address that. Uh, in addition, I've, I've seen courthouses recent where there are a lot of newspaper stands at or again, at or near the entrance. I would recommend, again, remove those uh, magazine and, and newspaper bins away from your front door uh, where the public, again, where the public convenes, where uh, prosecutors, probation officers, judges, the general public may go through and pass uh, through those uh, particular items that may have, again, uh, weapons. Uh, incendiary devices contained within, at or near. Maintaining foliage, cutting back shrubberies, shrubbery and bush, brushes and trees all along around the courthouse just to prevent someone from hiding or throwing contraband at or in or near that, uh, that area right there. Also encourage courthouses that do not have AEDs to consider uh, having AEDs, automatic external defibrillators installed in your courthouses. Um, there, it's a very common, I'm, I'm beginning to see this, uh, this year a lot of courthouses start to install these uh, AEDs in their courthouses. So something, again, it's a, it's a, uh, 
it'll address obviously in a medical emergency if you happen to have one in your courthouse. What's very important when it comes to facility self-protection is who is in charge. Uh, everybody in the courthouse is going to look at who is in charge in case you have a fire, bomb threat, natural disaster, riot, an active shooter. So each courthouse should at least have a determination, a determination made at their court security committee level as to who's in charge, who's going to make the decision, and have a plan in place to address, again, all these particular uh, disasters that could happen upon your courthouse. Here's an example of a courthouse that has three banks uh, around just immediately on each side of the courthouse. Now, if one or all those banks are robbed at the same time, it invariably is going to impact that courthouse. So you want to at least be able to shelter in place till the uh, bank robbery matter is resolved by law enforcement. So again, think about those things. Give your courthouses a look to see if you have banks or anything, any kind of building that may be impacted just as a result of, of the proximity near a courthouse. Again, along the same lines, riots, fires, uh, train your staff, practice, practice, practice evacuation drills, and everyone needs to be, again, uh, involved in this uh, matter. All the stakeholders of a courthouse need to be involved in this, uh, buy off on this, and practice. Courtroom security, it's entirely up to the judge to determine uh, whether he or she prefers to have defendants uh, fully restrained, partially restrained, or, or not restrained. So again, uh, work with your judges, see exactly what uh, their preference is, and certainly I would say encourage a, a defendant uh, to be fully restrained while in court. At least at a minimum, it discourages the possibility of that prisoner uh, from running or fleeing from the courthouse. The future of courthouse Security is, is quite unknown at this point. I mean, if I were to render a guess, we're going to meet, we may not ever see it, but it's going to somewhat look like TSA. Go to your local airport and you're going to see uh, uh, pretty much where I suspect court security in Texas may be way down the road. So again, we need to continue the discussion um, with, with, of court security, maintain it. And again, if you have any uh, concerns uh, to give us a call here at OCA, um, again, these are examples of, of again, uh, big brother watching, cell phone jammers, and of course, dogs that can sniff electronics. So again, we're not too far away uh, from perhaps going in this direction. But as you can see, uh, you know, the, the challenge that are facing courthouses every day uh, are certainly going to merit the discussion. Uh, I'll take some questions if you have any before we wrap this up. We do have a couple of questions, but now is a great opportunity that if you've been holding them the whole time to go ahead and let us know what they are. Uh, here we go. Let's see if I can get this ran down anymore. Uh, uh, do you have a sense of whether dramatic increase in reported incidences reflect more courts awareness of the need or, well, if I can see the rest of that question. Let's see if I slow that down. Nope. Uh, hmm. It's from John Morris, but I cannot see any more. Hector, do you have any experience well, with this since uh, you've done a couple of these? I can, I can probably in in my you know recent tenure here, I can tell you that incident reporting tends to evolve uh, a, a lot of verbal assaults. Uh, a little bit of contraband, but I can't say it's it precisely addresses a lack of uh, X-ray machines or magnetometers. I can tell you that uh, as this incident reporting increases, and it gives me the ability to 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 make a presentation to the legislature that says, "Look, these are the problems that are are, are we're having across Texas," and and the common denominator is a lot of these uh, courthouses lack. Uh, X-ray machines, magnetometers, and in most instances, even the human resources, the law enforcement component that's needed to uh, to react because you need to have uh, law enforcement involved in, 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 in any court security effort. So he, he follows up with, you know, more reports because courts are doing better in reporting or more bad events. Obviously, some courts have more resources. So that's that's what he's asking sort of is, is what's the, do you see any sort of cause and effect there? Well, I can tell you that obviously the, the a uh, vast majority of our court-related incidents are reported from 
um, large counties, large counties with obviously mega pop, mega million population, such as Harris County, Bear County, uh, Dallas County. Um, we do tend to get some from uh, out in rural West Texas, some, some reporting. Uh, we get it in the form of uh, threats or threatening behavior, but I can't say it's, uh, again, it's usually a cause and effect as a result of uh, a, a defendant that's not too particularly happy with a, a sentence that was rendered. Um, but, and then of course there's some subsequent issues like contraband contained within a, uh, in the possession of a defendant that's going into custody. So it, again, there's no, there's nothing I can specifically highlight and say, you know, it's, it's exactly, this is the cause of it. Uh, and then coming from Josh, you have one, one more question here. We'll get back to it, but we're going to move on real quick to James King. Obviously some courts have more resources than others for smaller municipal slash JP courts, what would you suggest is the most important upgrade that you could recommend implementing in prioritizing resources? If I were to say what would be the most important, it would be that you have a secondary way to get out of that building uh, in the event of a crisis, active shooter or whatever. I, I tend to uh, see a lot of JP and municipal courthouses that tend to have one way in, one way out. Um, we need to do a little bit better job in making sure that, and, and there are in fact some counties that I've dealt with that are actually uh, uh, carving out a back door for a lot of these uh, judges and staff to get out. But I would say a secondary means of getting out. Uh, this one comes from Linda McDonald. Who's in charge of getting security? Is it the judge? Is it the sheriff? Are we talking bailiffs? What are we what are we looking here? Well, I mean, at the county level, for example, if a court security committee decides and prioritizes their needs that, uh, let's say, for example, cameras are needed, uh, duress alarms are needed, they are going to have to request from their funding authorities, be it the uh, city council or the commissioner's court. That's why that's why I would recommend that you have a commissioner, at least on the court on your court security committee or if at the municipal level a city council member to at least advocate, at least be on the ground and advocate for your needs and give you an idea of whether that those some of those uh, you know needs are, are likely to be funded. Um, but it's entirely funded at the local level. There's no, no funding that I'm aware of that uh, is provided to uh, counties or, or municipalities to, to at this time enhance their security posture. Uh, returning back to uh, <laughs> Josh Morris is, how important do you believe personal panic buttons would be for judges? that are located in secure, limited access courtrooms, court uh, chambers, court offices? I think that personally that panic buttons sh should be located in as many places as they possibly can. I'm talking about judges' benches, judges' uh, uh, conference rooms, jury rooms, uh, judicial assistance offices. A lot of them right now are web-based. Uh, the newest version of a uh, panic alarm is web-based, so they're, they're very, you know, they're, they do. They come at no cost, significant cost, that you can add a lot of uh, features. Now, ideally, when you have these panic alarms, you certainly want them to obviously terminate at a law enforcement dispatch or at a local uh, security station if there is one in your courthouse. And then um, Blanco Ramos chimes in with, uh, which courts have higher risks of danger? In my opinion, and it's strictly an opinion just through my observations, is uh, Child support courts, uh, child protection courts, they tend to have a, uh, a higher level of, um, of, of, a, of a client uh, that, again, are, are not going to be happy with any of the decisions that are made by, by the judge. Uh, so obviously, the, it, it's, very, it's a volatile situation anyway when you're talking about taking away kids or parental rights or things of that nature. So that would be, in my, in my view, probably one of the highest courts that would be uh, subjected to a higher degree of violence. Uh, Linda McDonald follows up with a previous question of what is a courthouse security committee? A courthouse security committee, and I'm going to talk uh, both at the municipal level and the county level, is a local committee chaired or presided by the administrative judge of the county or the municipality. It is typically made up of, again, this there is no, uh, uh, again, playbook, but typically it's the stakeholders of that building, uh, the DA, uh, a judge from each jurisdictional level, a uh, clerk. Uh, you may have facilities and maintenance there. You may have uh, the chief of police, a city attorney, maybe a fire marshal. Uh, you're going to have people who, or you may even have a, consider to have a, a member of the public on your committee. So it's, again, it's, it can be very broad or it can be very intimate. 
uh, but typically those committees discuss issues that involve security. And I guess they address policies and procedures and, and make and look at, and, and the sheriff as well, and make funding and determination requests and present those, uh, those fundings to your local funding authority, be it the city council or the uh, county commissioner. All right, so another question coming in uh, from Edwin Klein in California. There is a law that prevents businesses from publishing elected officials' home addresses and telephone numbers. Can we have similar protections in Texas? And he cites the code Cal California Government Code Section 6254.21. I am aware that Judge Kashurik is uh, in is very well knowledgeable about this specific uh, bill in California. Uh, it does have merit. I just again, it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a I won't say much of a hurdle, but it certainly is uh, something that uh, should be considered and, and moved forward. So I, I'm in agreement with it. Okay, I think we've gotten to all of the answered que asked questions. If you asked a question and didn't have it answered, if you don't mind, please try and submit it again. Um, or if you have any more questions for Hector while we're still here, we have about 10 minutes left on the webinar, so we're open, and this is a good opportunity to get some of your questions in. I will tell you, give a, give a good, serious look at your uh, courthouse ass assessment. As an added feature, I do provide assessments uh, I schedule them according to uh, how, when I can get to your particular municipality or county, but it is an extra uh, benefit for you that uh, I can come to your county or your, your municipality, uh, evaluate your courthouse or your court building, and essentially what I apply is I, I apply the U.S. Courthouse Design Guidelines. So these are post-Oklahoma City guidelines that I use to uh, evaluate your courthouse. And my recommendations are merely that. They are recommendations, um, but they're based on best practices, uh, things that have happened or, or work better at other courthouses. And you decide based on those recommendations whether you want to uh, pursue them. Of course, the recommendations come in the form of zero to low cost items, such as policy changes, court orders that can affect behavior, as well as moderate cost uh, items such as signs, lock changes, and of course, high-end recommendations when we start getting into uh, a secure parking, to secure parking for judges and things of that nature that might cost, uh, have some considerable cost due to construction. So I, I think you've touched on this a little bit already, but he, I think uh, Adrian Pena asks, is there a policy or procedures manual somewhere for court security that can be copied? I do have and maintain a template. In fact, many templates I have, I, I, but, I, but specifically I do have a template for you in a Word document that I can provide for any, any, anyone for the asking uh, that's a uh, good document for you to build and layer your particular policies. Each courthouse is going to be different and uh, you may want to address things such as active shooters, bomb, again, as some of the things we mentioned today, medical episodes, uh, but it's a good document, source document that you can start building your particular local policies and procedures. Okay, uh, Edwin Klein asks, uh, can you publish a recommended individual first aid kit and contents to address gunshot wounds, knife wounds, et cetera, things that we have on hand while waiting for EMS, EMT? Yes, that should be something that's fairly easy for us to find. Uh, we we uh, do have some, some staff here at OCA that is in the process of developing our court security website, and our court security website will have, uh, as, as you just alluded to, this first aid kit, but also templates, go-bys, uh, documents, that personal security documents for judges, uh, things that you can certainly avail yourself for to utilize in your particular courthouse. Uh, Jack Jones asks, what are your recommendations regarding maintenance and cleaning staff having access to secure areas in the courthouse? Plain and simple, uh, I recommend that all uh, staff clean court facilities during the day and that if there are access badges that they certainly be programmed accordingly. And I'm talking about to specific hours and days of the week. Uh, but that would be my, uh, that is one of my standard recommendations on any assessment that I conduct. Uh, Valerie Graves asks, is there a cost for court evaluations? No, there is no cost. This is a, uh, again, this is a uh, benefit that I provide for you at no cost. It's just a matter of scheduling. It's a supply and demand issue right now. I'm, as you can probably imagine, quite in demand doing assessments. And uh, I just need to get you on the calendar and then work my way towards your particular county or city. 
Uh, so I think it's important to, to know that if you have that request, you know, make that request using the information here on the screen, um, and then we will work to get out as soon as we possibly can to you. We got about five more minutes, folks. If there are any more questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Um, this is really a good opportunity. Hector is 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 a one man show right now and doing a lot of work on the road. So you got him in a in a room. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And and there are again, court security is a very broad discussion. So again, if you have any ideas, there may be something that I've never thought about. Certainly, uh, you know, share it with us. Uh, we certainly will take a look at it. Uh, you know, it, again, every building is different. We've got to change the culture, and I think that's the, one of the greatest challenges right now is uh, that I'm facing is I've got to change the culture of court security in Texas. We have rural security, we have urban security, and then of course in some places we have uh, no such security at all. So we need to seriously address security because I, I understand that it's you know typically and historically have not has not been a uh, a, a heavily funded consideration when it comes to uh, the needs of a county courthouse, but you know, in recent times, as as things are beginning to happen, as we are starting to see things reported in the news and all these uh, serious violent events that happen, uh, the discussion is taking place. The uh, the material and, of course, the subject matter is relevant right now. And uh, again, county commissioners and uh, city councils are beginning to start to take the security uh, to sec the security concerns of their particular courthouse serious. Uh, some of you have been been chiming in and raising your hands. If you'll use the the questions uh, tab, that's the easiest way to get questions into us. We can't uh, use the raised hand questions, uh, but I've got a couple here. Uh, Kelly Guadalupe asks, uh, Guadalupe Kelly asks, is there a way for you to be able to travel to the rural West Texas area? The answer, short answer is yes. I have some uh, travel scheduled towards uh, El Paso and um, Hudspeth County. So I, that, that, that I already have planned. So yes, I, I, again, I've traveled to essentially all parts of Texas so far, and, and I'm certainly not immune to go where I need to go. Uh, let's see. Have you, uh, Grace Cantata asks, have you evaluated Harris County Courthouse at 201 Caroline Street, Houston, Texas? I have not had the opportunity, although I am scheduled to address uh, a retreat with the Harris County judges later on in the year. But no, the short answer to that question is no. Uh, let's see. Our Jack Jones asks, are camera recording in the courtroom subject to public access? If there are cameras in the courtroom, can the judge determine when they can be turned on and turned off? That is a question that I've uh, had come up. Uh, we don't have a hard answer for you. Uh, I, I would think that anything, anyone can try to, uh, through an open meetings request or a Public Information Act request, ask ask for something. So that's why I say go ahead and just err on the side of uh, just having it observe only and just try to avoid uh, um, recording just to, again, eliminate that possibility. Uh, Carlos Ibarra asked, would you agree that state courts should model federal courts? Ideally, in the perfect world, yes. That uh, I, I would just hope that, of course, that uh, you know, if we had all the money in the world, that that could be accomplished. But uh, if you've seen uh, federal courts, they're very standardized. Uh, if you go into one federal court and you go to another one, the other side of the, of the United States, they're virtually going to look the same in 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 the way the process works, the way their security system is layered. So yes, ideally, I, I certainly would agree with that statement. Uh, Aaron McLeish asks, how do we get a copy of that policy draft that was recommended earlier? Email. Yeah, I think the best way to get through us is to email Hector directly um, that, or, or call and leave him a voicemail. That way we know that we can get that information and filter it in the right way. Uh, can you stop by Culverson County? Well, I'll, I'll be more than happy to go by anywhere. If, if it's on, on my way going up or northeast, west, I certainly will stop by. Okay, and then I think this is the time. All the last question we have time for is when and where may we view this webinar at a later date? And I believe it's posted on our website. So there we have a webinar page on the website, uh, and I know it off the top of my head. I'm I'm stepping in as moderator today, but I will make sure um, I will make sure that we get that information out. Uh, Mr. Davenport, if you'll leave a an email with Hector or uh, or just generally with Office of Court Administration or give us a call, we'll make sure to get that information out as soon as possible. Uh, we want to thank you all for attending this webinar today. I hope it was really informative. Uh, thank Hector for taking the time out today to present with us. Uh, please, 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 if you have any questions related to court security, we are available. We will do our best to get back to you 
and get those answered. Uh, thanks and have a great weekend, guys.